If I say the word apple, you say the word Macintosh. But if I had played the same game just a few years ago and said Apple, you would probably say 2 or 2E or 2 Plus, for it was the Apple II that started this company. But with the recent success of the Macintosh and the Mac II in particular, there have been rumors that the old Apple II was headed for the orphanage. Not so, for there's a new Apple IIc and a new Apple IIgs. Today we take a look at the new generation of Apple II computers on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Chronicles is made possible in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte magazine, and VIX, the Byte Information Exchange. In print and online, Byte and VIX serve computer professionals worldwide with detailed information on new hardware, software, and technologies. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Schiffe, and this is Gary Kildall. Gary, what I've got over here in this little briefcase is an original Apple I computer. Before they thought about cases for computers, this guy put it into his briefcase. Uh, this is literally a museum piece, but it's only about 10 years old, and of course it represents state-of-the-art technology uh, at the time for personal computers. Knowing what we know about technology and PCs today, what is the point in coming out with a new 8-bit yeah. computer like the 2C Plus? <laughs> well, Stuart, it's important to understand what the Apple, really, where it came from. Uh, Steve Wozniak is the guy that engineered this thing, and he was a video person as well as a computer person. Mm -hmm. You realized you could put these two things together. Great for playing games, uh, real low cost because you hook it to your TV mm -hmm. set. As a result, they got a head start in a lot of the other PC uh, computer uh, manufacturers. A lot of software was produced, a good customer base. This is a sufficient machine for a lot of people to use in education, in the home, and so forth. And Apple said, well, why not service that customer base and give them a new machine? <laughs> well, we're going to take a look at that new machine today. It's the Apple IIc Plus, and we'll see how it has improved on its ancestors. We'll also take a look at GSOS, the new operating system for the Apple II GS, and its new ability to work with a CD-ROM drive. Now, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak were the architects of this early generation of Apple II computer. John Scully is the driving force behind Apple now, and we're going to start out this program by visiting John Scully in his office at Apple to find out about the company's real commitment to the future of the Apple II. Since its introduction over 10 years ago, the Apple II has proven to be a sturdy and persistent computer with a loyal following of devoted fans. There are now about four and a half million of them scattered around the world. But company support for the Apple II line, at least in the eyes of its owners, hasn't always been evident, as Apple President John Scully admits. Well, I think in many ways that Apple II users have felt abandoned by Apple because they haven't heard many messages from the top people in our organization to give them encouragement that the Apple II was important. And to be perfectly honest, this was a very conscious uh, direction on our part as we were trying to convince business users that Apple wasn't in the home computer business only, that we were also uh, able to provide very powerful business workstations. Without the success of the Macintosh in business, we couldn't afford the huge investment we have in research and development and the, the support of proprietary technologies for Macintosh and the Apple II. Today, the Apple II has become three machines, including the little changed 2E, the colorful 2GS, and the portable 2C+. But increasingly, the Apple II series appears to be headed in a different direction from the company's most powerful and expensive computer, the Macintosh. The best way to uh, really understand the two products is to look at the software bases that they have. The software base for the Apple II uh, is largely educational software, and enthusiast software and it continues to have a tremendous uh, amount of new software as well as many popular titles from the past. Uh, the Macintosh on the other hand from the start was a computer that was aimed at higher education, colleges, universities as well as business. Apple Computer has other reasons beside owner loyalty to keep the Apple II line moving forward. For one, it's a billion-dollar industry all by itself, and the machine has captured over 60% of the educational market. Moreover, the installed base is enough to keep users and suppliers busy for many more years. There are a lot of businesses that adopted the Apple II a long time ago that already had made the investment in Apple IIs, don't want to give up that investment 
they have their files on, on Apple II computers, and so the Apple II GS has found its way into many small businesses. As with any other kind of computer product, the marketplace determines whether a computer will live or die. And John Scully believes that customers for the Apple II will be around for some time to come. We'll do everything we can to make the Macintosh uh, as powerful as we can, but it doesn't mean that there aren't people out there who like a stick shift, uh, who want to have the, the real feel of the, of the chips, and that's the experience that you get with an Apple II. You're close to the Korahara, product manager for the Apple IIc Plus, and next to Laura is Bill Cleary, formerly with Apple, formerly with the Apple division of Activision, and now out on your own with Bill Cleary Communications. Gary? Laura, I'd say this is quite an improvement over the uh, Apple that was in the briefcase. That Apple one. <laughs> <in the briefcase. laughs> um, what, uh, what are you really, what are the new features of the Plus? Okay, um, just to start off with, you, we used to have in the 2C a five and a quarter inch mm -hmm. disk drive, and now we have a three and a half inch disk drive. So what that offers is five times the storage capacity and three times faster than five and a quarter accessing your um, programs. We used to have a power supply that was external on the 2C. We all remember the power supply. <laughs> yes, <laughs> brick on the leash. What we've done is internalized the power supply and it resides right here inside mm -hmm. the case. So we've done the obvious changes to the C, to the C plus so that they're, um, they're obvious, but they were important features that we needed to do to improve the C. Okay, just to be clear, that's not part of the new 2C? No, plus. it's okay. not. <laughs> it's, it's the old generation. It's the old generation, okay. and it, it, it is gone away. And How it's about inside. speed improvements? Is it a faster processor? Or? Yes, what we have done is um, we have a custom accelerator chip that is in the C plus, and what it does is help um, perform a four megahertz operation function for the user. Um, so instead of running at one megahertz where the 2C originally run, ran at, you are running at four megahertz operational mode. And this is optional to the user. So you cold boot the machine and you're coming up in four megahertz. And then you can um, do a keystroke selection mm -hmm. and go into one megahertz operation. So those operation. programs that are dependent upon timing could still run in the new. You've got a demo, right. I think, in which you can, you can show us the difference in those two speeds, could you? Yes, what I've done is this is going to be operating in one megahertz. So you get an idea of where we were at and where we're coming mm -hmm. to. So what I did is, this is Math Blaster Plus. It's a um, popular software application um, for education. It's a game on uh, learning your math. So we'll go into here, and we'll be able to see across here, if you take a look at this little guy running across here, and I turn the volume up, you're going to get an idea of what look and sound of one megahertz mm -hmm. looks like. Now, if I go in and I reset the machine, I'm going to reset the program into 4 megahertz. Mm -hmm. While we're waiting for it to reboot, then you're mentioning the three and a half inch floppies now. Uh, are you concerned at all that, I mean, the whole issue with the Apple II, of course, is the gigantic amount of software out there, right. all of which is on five and a quarter. Uh, aren't you concerned now that by switching disk formats, that sort of throws out that whole advantage to the user? Well, we were real concerned about that during our development process. So what we did is we seeded over 200 of our software and hardware developers, the majority of them being software developers. And what we wanted to assure is going from a transition of five and a quarter inch media to three and a half. And what we did is during this development process encouraged developers to move to the three and a half and make it available in their separate kit units on the, on the uh, dealer shelves. So on the day of introduction, we're real proud of the fact that um, we were able to announce over 500 software applications available on three and a half inch media in that separate box. So the user could walk in and purchase that software application, walk mm -hmm. home, and he'll have mm -hmm. his three and a half there without having to send a coupon in. Okay, can you show us four megahertz now? Yes. Now we rebooted and we'll go back into the game portion selection. Yeah, we're going to see this little guy running around again. And yeah, <laughs> you'll be able to hear it and see it. Watch him run at 4 megahertz, huh? You're right. Get back into here and choose level 1. And okay. here it's obviously right. showing yeah, right. you a faster speed. That's Consider three times faster. the performance okay. of now, now, the original. Now, Bill, obviously, I'm not going to buy a new computer to have this little guy run faster. 
What are the advantages really uh, to the 2C Plus and the kinds of users who would use that to the greater speed, to the three and a half inch floppy and so on? Well, I think there's a lot of, uh, the, you know, the, the real excitement about Apple's Apple II line, I think over the years, has been the large number of third party solutions out there. Uh, there are products like Apple Works, which provide, from Claris, which provide incredible functionality in terms of home productivity mm -hmm. or even running a small business. Uh, there's just a large number, everything from Print Shop, which is really an Apple II prototype for desktop publishing, which actually impacted the high end of the business. Uh, the Apple II is just a phenomenal machine, and the real mystery or the real secret about it, uh, I think, can be summed up um, uh, in, in a phone conversation, just paraphrasing what happened a few years ago when I was working at, uh, as a vice president of uh, marketing at a, at a software company here in mm -hmm. Silicon Valley. And I was asked, why, why uh, isn't the Amiga going to knock off this machine? And the answer was real simple. I said, I think the Amiga can knock off the Apple II if it does the following things. If it can before, within the next two months, get 60% uh, of the education market, uh, if it can get 10,000 software mm -hmm. programs out there, and if it can get, uh, at the time, two and a half million loyal users to support it. And I think that's part of the magic of the Apple II, and there's a lot of reasons uh, why I think people continue to buy them. Uh, Laura, you, you talked about, and we talked about the three and a half inch floppy. You've got some more options now with the 2C Plus in terms of peripheral drives and so on, don't you? Yes, we did. What we added to the line with the original 2C, um, if you wanted three and a half inch media compatibility, you use the Unidisc. What we've added to the line is it's still the option of using the Unidisc. Um, the Apple 3.5, which you can use on the Apple 2GS, and then the Apple 5.25. So now you have all three drives that are compatible for the product, for the Apple 2C product mm -hmm. in our line. It's amazing how large that looks now. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the new, the new size disc. Bill, what do you think about the positioning of this particular machine, the 2C Plus? Is that going to be in the same traditional niche where the 2 has been? Well, the, you look at the evolution of the machines. You now have a GS, which provides improved sound and graphics and, and the mouse interface uh, that people are familiar with on the Macintosh mm -hmm. computer. I think the difference, I think that the, the 2C makes a lot of sense for people and I don't know from a positioning standpoint what this means, but for, for people who, whose kids may be in K through 12 using an Apple IIe, which is the standard in schools, right. uh, to go home and to, to buy for the home an Apple IIe, it makes a lot of sense. It's a, it's a logical choice at Christmas time. Mm -hmm. what's, what's the ideal machine you'd like to see coming out from Apple? Uh, personally, because I have a lot of Apple IIc okay. software, I've been associated with the machine for eight years now. Uh, the Apple II family of products, not the, just the yeah. 2C. Uh, I would say I'd like to see a machine that that has that uh, where I could run all the high-end Macintosh stuff and also could run all the Apple II stuff. It's probably an unrealistic <laughs> you dream. You want the <laughs> Apple Master Machine? The, the dream Master Machine was about the size of the uh, <laughs> uh, the, two, the the 2C yeah. Plus there with a with a f with a flat panel screen that I could take on, on on plane trips and whatnot. Or if I wanted to run some old 2 stuff, I could I could still do that. I think it'd be a fantastic uh -huh. product. I, I know Apple can't formally comment on this, but what would you think about that? I mean, is it a laptop Apple IIc, you know, battery powered and uh, flat screen and so on? Would that be a sensible product? Uh, I think from a cost standpoint, it would be very difficult for Apple to do a product like that. I, mean, I see the, uh, uh, the GS as sort of an evolutionary step in terms of giving people the Macintosh interface, but I, I don't know whether or not from a cost standpoint you could do a machine that had a coprocessor. Mm -hmm. um, that could accommodate both sides of the, you know, the Apple family. Uh, but to me, it would be the ideal machine. You know, personally, I, I would love to buy one. Okay, Bill, Laura, thank you very much. Now, the uh, Apple IIc Plus is not the only new 2 coming out of Apple these days. There's a new Macintosh 2, the Mac 2X, and Wendy Woods takes a look at that new machine. <laughs> The top-of-the-line Apple model, the Macintosh 2X, breaks new ground for the company. It's the first Apple Mac to use Motorola's powerful new 68030 microprocessor. It's got a standard memory of 4 megabytes, runs at 16 megahertz, is 10 to 30 percent faster than the Macintosh 2, and most importantly, is the first Apple product to read and write to the IBM MS-DOS format. The message we get most clearly is people love our technology and they want to use it. And the less painful we can make it for them to transition out of an old technology, the easier it is for us to sell our technology. The Macintosh 2X drive is operated by Apple's file exchange software, which can read and write 3.5-inch MS-DOS or OS2 diskettes, Macintosh diskettes, or Apple II ProDOS diskettes.
In this demonstration, the 2X is reading and converting a Lotus 123 file made on an MS-DOS laptop to a file that can be used in Microsoft Excel on the Macintosh. Within a few years, this top of the line will become the middle of the line, and you can see the direction in which Apple is heading. A future of powerful color Macintoshes in which the data from many kinds of machines will be interchangeable. In Cupertino, California, for the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy. And next to Anne is Stu Roberson, Director for Marketing with Activision. Yeah, and over the years we've seen various versions of the Apple II. Uh, mm -hmm. We just saw the C Plus and so forth. How do you differentiate, uh, differentiate the GS from the rest of the Apple line? The GS is the top of the line for the Apple II product family, and it sells into both consumer as well as education markets, but it's really the most powerful platform we have. But it is still an Apple II Oh, it's compatible. definitely an Apple II, and it okay. runs all the Apple II software yeah. that's available. Uh, can you uh, show us what, uh, what it looks like? What you're working sure, with sure. Mm -hmm. The key thing, Anne, is really the operating system here. Yes, it's not a definitely. new machine, it's a new no. operating system. The GS has the been out for almost two years, and what I'm booting up right now is the new Apple II GS system software, version 4.0, mm -hmm. which we recently introduced about a month ago at Apple Fest. Well, while it's boot booting up, uh, mm -hmm. can, could you, have you identified the customer base now? I obviously you have over the past two years. Who buys the GS? Um, people who are interested in doing home productivity, families, mm -hmm. and um, we have a very large education base in both K through 12 areas as well as some college base, but it's primarily a K through 12 machine and home productivity mm -hmm. machine for families. Okay. So what we're booting into right now is basically the heart of the, of the new system software, which is GSOS, the new operating mm -hmm. system. And some of the improvements that GSOS brings to the GS are, first of all, increased disk access, which, as you can see, s definitely speeds the boot time of the system over our previous system software. And we've also introduced the concept of file system translation. And essentially, what file system translation allows us to do is um, access data files from other operating systems. Mm -hmm. And um, what we've done is we've created new tools called FSTs, or file system translators, mm -hmm. which allow us to do that. And one of the things I'd like to demonstrate today is um, the file system translator for the High Sierra file system. And as you can see, we've got a system right here that's configured with CD-ROM. And um, one of the things that we can do is, through using the High Sierra FST, we can actually um, access applications CD-ROM applications such as Bookshelf, which is from Microsoft. And bring it right into Multiscribe. And bring it right mm -hmm. into Multiscribe. M Multiscribe is a very popular GS mm -hmm. word processing program. A lot of our users have it. Um, so what I am right now, I'm in a Multiscribe file. And what I'm going to do is go into my disk area. And I'll go ahead and scan through some of my different volumes here until I bring up Bookshelf. And I'll go ahead and open a Bookshelf file. Let's just say I want to access Bartlett's quotations, okay. for instance. And I've actually imported a, a, a data file from Bookshelf into my Multiscribe package. And this really opens up the world of CD-ROM for our users, and especially our education customers are very interested in, in being able to access all the data that you mm -hmm. can find on CD-ROM what, uh, what are the kind of applications that you, do you really see in the CD-ROM area? Um, well, CD-ROM is really a, a new industry for us, and it's really exploding, and, and we're supporting it now with um, the CD-ROM drive that we introduced in March. And this is the first time we've actually supported it on the Apple II line. Okay. So mm -hmm. any large storage um, application, you know, this one is, is a good example. Um, I guess encyclopedia. Exactly. Stuff, okay. exactly. <laughs> Anne, could, you, could you run us back to the operating system sure. and show us some of the new tools that are in the OS? Yeah, in addition to the new operating system, we've created two new t utilities that will really help our users better manage their hard files as well as configure their systems. As, as, you, as you probably know better than I, computing is becoming much more complex. Mm -hmm. And um, so two of the new utilities that we have, what I'm launching right now is the installer. And the installer is a great program because it allows the user to really easily configure their systems. Um, if you start adding hard drives and CD-ROMs and various other things, it becomes somewhat complicated to make sure you have the right drivers. So on the right 
or left hand side right here I have some of the different drivers that you can add to your system everything from MIDI to image writer support to the CD-ROM support let's just click on CD-ROM and install this driver that way I know I'll definitely be able to run this program mm -hmm. and what you can see right now is a little box that's giving you feedback on the process of adding the driver as well as what files are being added so you don't have to worry about the different system file mm -hmm. management it's taken care of for you okay, you got one other new utility in there don't you sure let me get out of this and we'll go into the advanced disk utility right. and that lets you do what the advanced disk utility really helps you set up your hard drive and manage the information that's found there and um, users, when, when they first start putting, setting up their hard drive, they'll need to either initialize it or zero it out if it has other information. But another important um, element to this is partitioning. And that's something we haven't supported prior to today, or actually in the last month. Mm -hmm. And what I'm showing you right now is a new partitioning utility. And what I have on the, on the, the right side here are three different partitions that um, uh, we've set up on this particular hard drive. And I'll show you that we can change the partition size as well as... Um, and why, why are you partitioning the, the disk? Sure. One of the reasons you might partition a disk is to have different file formats. Okay. Um, maybe you want to so mix past out fi uh, files with ProDOS yeah, files, things like, like that. that. Mm -hmm. So I can yeah. add and delete partitions and b change the partition sizes. Okay. So. Okay, Anne, can I ask you to load up Stu's program sure. while I talk to Stu? Uh, how important is the 2GS as a product line to software developers like Activision? Well, Activision is really dedicated to the Apple 2GS and to that education and home marketplace that Anne had mentioned. Uh, to the large, growing developer base, I think you're seeing a lot more activity in the GS as some of the original Apple II developers have now started shifting their emphasis over to the new machine. Do you have any idea what the size of that market is now? Right now, there's over 300,000 2GSs installed, and that's mm -hmm. growing. Mm -hmm. uh, we anticipate, as what happened last year, that during the Christmas quarter, they'll sell more Apple 2GSs than any other Apple mm. CPU. Stu, you've got a paint program from Activision, uh, which takes advantage of the graphics of the GS. Describe it and show it to us. Yeah, this is Paintworks Gold, and Paintworks Gold is one of eight products that we make for the Apple 2GS. Paintworks Gold was derived from Paintworks Plus, which is a 512K version of the product for ease of use and has made its way into many schools. What we're going to take a look at here are some of the advanced features that you can do with the 2GS using Paintworks Gold. Now, the image it's going to load is one that you may have seen. It's the Taj Mahal. And we're going to use two features, slippy colors, which mm -hmm. is a unique feature, and then masking colors to make the Taj Mahal actually reflected in the pool below. What Slippy Colors actually allows you to do is define colors for your lasso tool to slip around. So we're going to define all the colors that are used in this sky. Then we're going to choose our lasso tool and select the Taj Mahal. Mm -hmm. You'll note once I have released this that just the Taj Mahal is selected. This allows you to pick out objects that you want from any painting. Now we're going to go ahead and flip this Taj Mahal around to paste it down below. So we'll just flip it vertically. And now we have our Taj. Now I'm going to move the screen around a bit. So first we'll cut this out, grab our handle. Now let's paste in the Taj Mahal. As we move it up, now we have a perfect reflection. Mm -hmm. Well, near perfect, because you can see it's overlapping the grass. Well, that's where masking colors comes in. We can actually mask these colors so that you can paint behind them or mm -hmm. around them. Show us how you do that. I'll go ahead and mask some colors here. And I'm going to mask every single color and then unmask the colors that may be in the water. Now you'll note as it has made its selection that instantly the Taj goes behind. In fact, you can actually paint behind the mm -hmm. other objects that you see here on the screen. Now the last thing that we're going to do here is just make this a nice sunset picture. And we'll do that by changing the colors. Now the sky was actually created using some gradient colors. We'll go in and change those colors. We'll choose a color of red and I want to adjust my entire palette to it. And I'll start picking out some oranges that might work well in a sunset sky. And there you have very it. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an impressive product. Stu, thank you very much. It's a nice looking yeah. machine and operating system, and thank you. That's our look at the new Apple IIc Plus and the new Apple IIgs. Hope we'll see you here again next week on the Computer Chronicles.
random access file this week, an announcement from Toshiba that could replace floppy and hard disk drives in the near future. Toshiba says it has developed a 4 megabit, electronically erasable, programmable read-only memory chip. The chip provides a readout time of 1.6 microseconds. This is approximately a thousand times faster than conventional floppy disk, and it takes a chip one microsecond to erase or store data. Toshiba says the chip eliminates the need for floppy or hard disk drives, and Toshiba believes without the cumbersome disk drives, drastically smaller smaller computer systems could be on the market within three years. A new Macintosh laptop should be out by this summer. Still no specific launch date has been announced, price range or specifications for the system. But there have been leaks by a Dylan Reed analyst who says the new model should be introduced in June and cost about $6,000. And the word is the launch of the laptop has been delayed by problems with screen display. President Bush has okayed the foreign takeover of the U.S.'s last major producer of silicon wafers used to make computer chips. A West German firm has bought the California Monsanto Electronic Company. The U.S. now produces none of the silicon wafers made in the world, while the Japanese provide 70 percent and European companies 26 percent. The sale of Monsanto, the world's sixth largest producer of the wafers, was announced last November. TV newsman in St. Petersburg, Florida, has been arrested for allegedly cracking his former employer's computer system. Michael Shapiro left his station for a competitor four months ago. In January, an investigation showed that files were missing from his former station's newsroom computer. A probe by the phone company led police to Shapiro. Shapiro is now on a leave of absence from his current job. He is facing 14 counts of computer-related crime. His bond is set at $14,000. Making long-distance phone calls and charging them to your home couldn't get much easier than this. U.S. Sprint is testing a telephone calling card that can only be used when the cardholder's voice print is verified. The voice card, as it's being called, is being tested by employees and selected customers. Here's how it works. Dial the 800 number, then dial in an easy-to-remember number, like your birth date, then give a two-second verbal password. Your voice is then compared to your voice print on Sprint's record. If it matches, the call goes through. If not, it's blocked. Here's something students may be interested in. Microsoft and Simon & Schuster's Prentice Hall College Book Division will publish a student version of Microsoft's Excel spreadsheet. The release date is scheduled for April. The student edition will include all the features of the retail edition. Candelia, a vast kingdom, a peaceful futuristic world ruled by the Lockarm dynasty for ages. Its secrets are locked in the sword of power. Its creation is from the imagination of one 15-year-old Jeffrey Campbell of Colorado. Campbell just won first prize for his story. He was competing in a contest by Nintendo. The contest was to come up with the wildest plot for a new video game. Campbell did and won. Campbell's game idea was just one of over 10,000 entries by youngsters ages 8 to 15. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. I'm Cynthia Steele. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte Magazine, and VIX, the Byte Information Exchange. In print and online, Byte and VIX serve computer professionals worldwide with detailed information on new hardware, software, and technologies. For a transcript of this week's Computer Chronicles, send $4 to PTV Publications, Post Office Box 701, Kent, Ohio, 44240. Please indicate program date.